Welcome to this presentation on RIPES, a visual computer architecture simulator. In this talk, we'll first go through some of the requirements that we would set for an educational computer architecture simulator, see how these affected the design of RIPES, and then spend some time on going through a demo of the program to get a feel for how it can be used to teach some of the core concepts of computer architecture and systems. At the end, we'll take a brief look at some of the internals of RIPES and comment on possible future directions for the project. But before we start, I just briefly want to go over the history of the project. So the project started back in 2016 as a simple instruction set simulator for the RISC-V instruction set. Then two years later, the first official release occurred, which featured a single processor model. Then in 2019, work began on a spin-off project called VSRTL, which is a framework for describing visual simulations of digital circuits. This project was then integrated into RIPES in 2020, which also allowed for the inclusion of multiple different processor models in the program. And since then, features such as cache simulation, C integration, a multiple issue processor model, and memory mapped I.O. have been released. So the project is alive and well and always open for new contributions and collaborators. In teaching introductory computer architecture, we would normally view this through the lens of an undergraduate course. In such a course, we would expect to go through what an instruction set is, as well as a bit of assembly level programming. But then the bulk of the course would probably focus on microarchitecture, typically starting from describing a single cycle processor, where we also get introduced to all of the common elements that we would expect to see across all in-order designs. And then we consider pipeline processes, as well as the hazards introduced by pipelining the single cycle processor, and how we would address these in our design and alongside that introduce the concept of forwarding. And then we would expect a significant portion of the course to be dedicated on memory systems as well, such as caches, GLBs, and so forth. Now, considering these requirements, we can then take a look at some of the typical simulator capabilities of the simulators that we see out there. We have online simulators, which generally focuses on just the instruction set and assembly programming. Now, given that they're browser-based, these are great simulators for when you're just starting out. And next we have the more functional simulators like QMU or Spike, which are able to efficiently execute compiled binaries. And then finally we have these visual simulators, which tries to give insight into the state of the processor's data path while we're executing a program. So we can then ask the question, why don't we have a single application to experiment with and learn about all of the core concepts of the field while unifying simulator capabilities? And so this essentially sums up the motivation behind RIPES. So, what is RIPES? At its core, it's a visual computer architecture simulator and assembly editor built for the RISC-V instruction set. Many of the features of RIPES, as well as visualization styles that's used, you'll be able to find scattered across older tools and academic projects. There seems to be a lot of work from the early 2000s on visual computer architecture simulators, but pretty much all of these projects are no longer active or they don't support the instruction sets that are taught nowadays. So, Many of the features of RIPES are not necessarily new. Rather, RIPES can be seen as a modern implementation of many of these ideas, but in the form of an actively managed open source project. In my personal opinion, I think that it's, this is one of the key reasons for why RIPES has been adopted to be used in teaching at many different universities across the world. Because it's not just an academic exercise, but instead tries to be a real, living, breathing open source project. Now, in terms of specific features, RIPES currently implements the RV32 INM instruction sets. A few different processor models are available to show different design points, from single cycle to pipeline and multiple issue processors. And the main point of RIPES is to provide a visual simulator. So in this, we want to show the state of the data path during program execution, where we want to highlight things such as multiplexer operand selection, pipeline stage, stalling and clearing and so forth. There's also an integrated assembly editor and a memory viewer inside. And various higher level expressions can also be explored, such as cache simulation, compiling and executing C programs within RIPES, as well as support for memory mapped I.O. Next we'll go through a demo of the program to take a look at how we can use RIPES in some classic use cases. The first tab that we'll see is the processor tab. Here a visualization of the processor is shown where we see the different components of a data path, such as memories or multiplexes. 
Currently a five stage processor is loaded, however multiple other processor models are also available. We see here we have a single cycle model, we have different versions of the five stage pipeline, as well as a six stage dual issue model, which shows a bit of a more advanced design point than the classic five stage pipeline. Next, the editor tab. Here we can write assembly programs, or if we registered a C compiler with RIPES, we can write C programs. On the right hand side, a view of the disassembled program is shown, where the instructions present in each pipeline stage are also highlighted. Now, to run the program, we clock the processor by clicking this button. When the processor had to stall a stage due to a dependency, this can be clearly seen by the indication above the given pipeline stage. We are then able to go back in time, which essentially means that we are undoing clock cycles, to take another look at the state of the data path in the cycles which led up to the interesting situation. Next, let's load a slightly larger example. When a change in the source code occurs, the program will be automatically assembled and loaded into simulator memory. Pressing this button here will automatically clock the processor with the given interval specified here. Observing program execution in the disassembled view gives us a sense for how different parts of the program, as in different instructions, can be present in the pipeline of the processor at the same time. This is essentially a visualization of instruction level parallelism. In the processor tab, we'll also see a running computation of the IPC, instructions per cycle, when executing the program to get a sense for how our microarchitecture affects program execution efficiency with relation to the number of cycles that we have to go through while executing the given program. Next, let's take a look at cache simulation. Here you can see the cache simulation tab in RIPES. In the top left corner, we can select whether we are viewing the L1 instruction or data cache. The caches can be configured both in terms of their geometry as well as the policies which they use and the cache visualization will then adjust accordingly. At the bottom, a plot can be configured to show various cache statistics such as hit rate. The running total as well as a moving average of the given statistic will then be plotted. I've loaded in an example program which exercises the cache a bit and we're now going to execute that program. Again, what we're seeing here is the hit rate computed as the ratio between cache hits and cache accesses. The blue line showing the running total is seen to start stabilizing at around 77%. However, looking at the moving average, we're seeing that there are separate parts of the program which seem to have either better or worse cache behavior relative to the running total. So this is the use of the moving average. So, to sum up, the cache simulation allows us to configure our own cache geometries, see how they're indexed during execution, as well as investigate how a particular program and where inside this program different cache behavior can be observed. The final tab that we're going to see is the IO tab, which was recently added in the 2.2 release. For now, only three devices are available, an LD matrix, some switches, and a D-pad. I'll go ahead and instantiate an LD matrix and some switches. On the right hand side, we can see the configuration parameters exposed by a device. In the case of the LD matrix, I can configure the width or the height or the LT size. In the middle we see the register map exposed to the device showing the base address offsets of the different registers, how the registers may be accessed, as well as the size of the register in bits. At the bottom we see the symbols which are exported by the device. These symbols are made available in both the assembly editor as well as provided to the compiler if you write C programs in RIPES. Finally, the set of all symbols are shown here. This is essentially the header file that is included in the compilation process. Next, I'll load an example program which writes to the LD matrix. The important thing to note here is the use of the symbols that were defined by the matrix. If we remove the matrix, an error message will be shown stating that the reference symbols are undefined. Now, moving to the IO tab. When using memory mapped IO, we might be at a point where we are less interested about the cycle to cycle effects which a program has on a processor pipeline and care more about having a faster simulation. To facilitate this we can then run the processor without updating the UI 
which yields a much faster simulation. And then, as you see here, an animation is shown on the LEDs. We're now going to take a look at the most important internal component of RIPES, which is VSRTL. VSRTL stands for Visual Simulation of Register Transfer Logic. Now this project started as a spin-off of RIPES, given that we needed a method for a structured approach to describing cycle-accurate processor models, which also showed a visualization of all of the components that were within this design. The main features of the framework is that it exposes a domain-specific simple hardware description language embedded in C++ for describing digital circuits. We can then index these designs and generate a visualization that then interacts with the underlying simulator to create a one-to-one -one connection between what you see on screen and the state of your circuit. The simulator itself is cycle accurate with the special ability to, as we saw during the demo, step back in time. This is why we undo clock cycles so that we can visually inspect, or we could also call it debug, interesting situations which occurs in our circuit during simulation. In terms of the library itself, it's split into three parts. VSRTL Core, Components, and Graphics. VSRTL Core contains the DSL as well as circuit primitives such as ports and components, and it's also here where all of the simulator logic resides. On top of this is a small standard library, VSRTL Components, which implements things such as multiplexes and logic gates. The actual circuit description itself is based only on the core and components libraries. This means that the circuit model is fully independent of anything related to visualization and allows for the circuit to be compiled as a standalone program that can then be executed through the command line. Finally, there is the graphics library which is based on Qt. The graphics library expects an underlying simulator to implement an interface that allows us to traverse a circuit, receive state change signals from a circuit, and so forth. This means that the graphics library is fully independent of VSRTL core which is an intentional design decision that allows us to add other simulator backends. Now, why design it like this? Well, we can design many things using the DSL of VSRTL, but it would also be nice if we could use this method of visual simulation that VSRTL provides, but with existing designs described in commonly used hardware description languages. So then this interface provides a place where we in the future could try and hook into things such as System C or Verilator. So to wrap up, let's consider some possible future directions for the project. First, there's a bit of low-hanging fruit, this being branch prediction and support for the 64 and 128-bit instruction set variants. Now, implementing these would not be a massive undertaking, and I'm quite sure that they would be relevant to quite a few users out there. And then next, we can consider some more advanced processor models, such as out-of-order processors. The difficulty here is that there isn't really consensus on one single design that is taught in contrast to the classic five-stage pipeline that is typically used in undergraduate computer architecture courses. But I think that if we're able to find a single or a few design points to represent, then this would really help in making the simulator more applicable to a few more advanced topics. And then finally, regarding VSRTL, right now there's a lot of exciting work going on in the space of open source hardware compilation toolchains, and I think it would be great to be able to interface into this growing ecosystem to provide a method of visual simulation. Now, whether this would be targeting fertile, verilator, or some abstraction in circuit, we'll have to see. But uh, yeah, I think there's some very interesting work to be done here. So thank you for listening to the talk. Again, RIPES is available on GitHub, so please don't hesitate to try it out or to send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you.